And the space shuttle should uh, have completed its deorbit burn. We expect in uh, maybe 15 or 20 seconds to uh, hear uh, formally that that has been accomplished. Let's pick up now the voice of mission control to see whether that deorbit burn has been successfully completed. Houston, radio lock clear, and the burn was good. Okay, that's super, Joe. Uh, one uh, change to the plan. Uh, John's last weather flight indicated that our cross uh, terrific plant, uh, news that is. We don't have to come on top high, of those. So we're going to ask absolute you to, uh, terrific news. The uh, new orbit burn was completed successfully. Your prime runway, and we'll uh, make a uh, landing on two three over. Affirmative, runway 23, over. That would be the first time the astronauts have heard uh, that they are going to change runways? Yes. A little more than 50 minutes now until the landing of uh, the space shuttle. The deorbit burn has been completed. The crew now changing the going through the change of attitude with the spacecraft to get ready uh, for the tremendous heat and friction that the craft faces as it re-enters the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Five minutes remaining in the past, Let's uh, go to Edwards Air Force Base in California okay, where uh, Walter Cronkite and Leo Krupp later. are. Uh, and, uh, Walter, uh, the wind seems to uh, not have died down any. Has it picked up any? Uh, I wouldn't say so. It's been holding about steady. The last time John Young made a landing pass in that, uh, in that uh, Grumman uh, 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 orbiter test plane they use. Uh, he got wind uh, readings out there on the runway of 12 to 19 miles an hour, or knots actually, it translates roughly miles an hour. Uh, and that's too much, they decided, for a first attempt at a crosswind landing with this orbiter. So they've changed to uh, the runway that'll bring them almost directly into the wind. It makes it a much easier operation and a much safer one uh, for the uh, shuttle. Uh, now, it still means that they're going to have to take over controls uh, a little bit more than had been anticipated, perhaps, because up at the uh, altitude where they have to make the turn, they come in, you know, almost flying east, and they turn around and come back flying west to make the landing. Uh, where they make that turn, uh, at but about uh, uh, 25, 30,000 feet, it's blowing uh, better than a hurricane force, 90 knots of wind, according to John Young. Well, at that uh, speed of wind, it means that uh, the automatic control system would try to bank that plane a lot, uh, a lot sharper than otherwise to make that turn quickly enough before it's blown off course. Uh, and uh, banking like that at that speed, at that point they're going about 600 miles an hour, just short of the speed of sound, as Leo Krupp has pointed out to us, forces those men right down into the floorboard. It pulls a G-force that's pretty heavy for the pilots, but more than that, it's more than the shuttle is built for in the tolerance. Uh, Walter, uh, if well, I may, I don't mean to, Walter, I don't mean to interrupt, but if I may, uh, what are the chances that they will, in the end, uh, rule out a manual control, manually controlled landing, and go to a, an automatic uh, control landing? Well, I think Leo can answer that. It's almost nil because, as I was just trying to explain, Dan, uh, a automatic controlled landing with that turn would mean that the plane has to bank so sharply uh, following the course around that the automatic landing is programmed for that they'd have a g-force against the plane that is greater than they want so instead uh, joe engel flies the plane around that turn and banks much uh, less sharply than otherwise but can cut across the turn blow out let let himself be drifted out by the wind and still make the approach as planned is that right leo yeah that's right uh, Walter. the auto land would probably pull around two g's it's really not too much for a pilot but it's more than we like to pull on the shuttle so joe will take over manually and he will lead turning onto that turn around the final so that he can let the wind drift him that way he doesn't have to bank as steeply as the auto land would bank him but once he gets around and gets lined up with the runway it's my guess that he will probably as soon as he acquires auto land guidance he'll center up the needles null everything out and he'll punch over to auto and he will accomplish the auto land test objective that we want to do and that's why auto land 
from about 10,000 feet down to 2,000 feet. They just advised the uh, astronauts, uh, Dan, uh, that the auto land system has not been ruled out and very probably will be ruled back in. It was ruled out when they were going to make that crosswind landing on the other runway here. Now, they're, what they're telling them is that they'll probably go back to the auto land system now that they're on the runway into the wind and no, no crosswind problems. Uh, but they haven't advised them uh, exactly of that as yet. Uh, back to you, Dan. And our CBS News coverage of the return of Space Shuttle 2 will continue after these messages. <laughs> Do you know me? I've taken ragtime to Vienna and Beethoven to Kalamazoo. And wherever I travel, I use the American Express card. For the same reason, I use a Stradivarius. To apply for a card, look for this display wherever the card is welcomed. The American Express card. Don't leave home without it. Hi, Ellen. The astronauts have completed the deorbit burn high above the Earth's surface. They are now trying to position the spacecraft uh, for that tremendous heat and friction in the space as the Earth's atmosphere begins to uh, hit against the bottom of the spacecraft. We are about roughly 15 minutes from the time that the astronauts go into their communications blackout. We are about 44 and a half minutes away from the landing at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Morton Dean has been covering the flight from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. That, of course, is the place where the flight is controlled. It's also the place where the astronauts train. And Mort's been reporting on that, too. And on one occasion, he actually went through some of the training program. The correspondent arrives. Like a good soldier, he has volunteered for this assignment. The crew of the second shuttle flight arrives. Richard Truly and Joe Engel. They're here because they have to be. It's part of their training. In civilian life, the plane is a 707. Inside, it's been converted to resemble a giant padded cell. Soon the work and the fun begin. <laughs> It's like swimming in air or walking on air. Down is up and up is down. There's no up or down in zero G. How does it happen? It happens by turning the plane into a roller coaster. The plane rockets upward a 45 degree high speed climb to about 32,000 feet. Then it's throttled back and arcs over that's when zero gravity or weightlessness occurs while it's arcing over. Zero G lasts about 25 seconds, and then the plane plunges, plunges about 10,000 feet. And then up we go again. And there we go again. Whoa! There we go again. Complete lightheadedness. Let's see the ball now. The ball is going, drifting off toward the cameraman. Not a bad curve there. As if your body just wants to fly off this chair. The main purpose of these flights is for the astronauts to get used to working in zero G. The shuttle crew, Engel and Truly, had specific tasks to perform during each period of weightlessness. What did you learn today? What were you trying to accomplish? Well, we've been having a hard time uh, more getting in and out of the suit and connecting the ring, and so we kind of curious on how a lot of the little things like loading the camera and, and uh, some of these cameras together and eating some of the food in zero gravity. That really works. Uh, some of the equipment that we're taking along, we were really curious to see just if there were any things that we ought to know about ahead of time, be ready for when we got on, on uh, orbit, because that's kind of expensive time up there. But mainly putting on and taking off the suit. This type of flight is the only way for the astronauts to get a real feel for traveling in space without going there. It's an unusual work environment for a CBS news crew. Cameraman Pat O'Dell, soundman Arnie Jensen, and... Comes my producer Mark Kramer here, upside down. And we're moving along with the greatest of ease. The plane did 50, 50 of those roller coaster maneuvers on this flight. Up and down, 
up and down, up and down, up and down for almost two hours. How you guys doing? Don't ask. Quite a flight. It's a great one, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's great to a certain point, I guess. <laughs> but it is unusual. There's a knack to doing that, just like there's a knack to getting in front of a TV camera and, and looking right into it. I guess. But everybody keeps telling me, even astronauts get sick sometimes. Oh, you so bet your life. You're dang right. Joe Engel and Richard Truly passed this test with flying colors, and some of us were green with envy.